Thank you, thank you, Brendan, and thank you all for coming. Um, flattered that so many people would take time out of the day. Um, let's start with a quote, one of the most commonly quoted um, utterances of a politician over the past 10 years or so, Jean-Claude Juncker's saying that we all know what we need to do about economic reform. The problem is getting elected afterwards. In fact, that's not true. We actually don't know. So if you've come here today expecting great certainty about what we should do in Europe, you're not going to get it. But there will be a whole range of issues and, and some thoughts on, on what can be done. But I do stress that from the beginning, uh, that there really is a lot of uncertainty around the whole uh, growth picture. Let's just take a, a long view about economic growth. Uh, economic growth is a relatively new thing. It's only since the Industrial Revolution that there's really been any kind of sustained growth. Before that, uh, over the centuries, there really was very little economic growth. So it's, it's, it's a new phenomenon. Uh, and because it's new and because the economics profession is a young uh, discipline, we really still don't know. Uh, Robert Sollow was one of the people who won a Nobel Prize for his, 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 his work on economic growth, and that was uh, a comment he made, which is as true today pretty much as it was when, when he made it. And we can see this, again, as Brendan alluded to, on the one hand, the two hand, and the three hand. Okay, so here's, here's sort of three hands. We've, we've got three... In terms of economic growth, three groups, broadly speaking, uh, we've got the optimists, these two guys from MIT, and, and some other people, think that we're on the cusp of a, another industrial revolution, another inflection point because of the new technologies that have been developed in recent times, all of which you know, we, we, we use, we know, and we'd become lot, much less productive without. And then we've got the growth pessimists, uh, this, this guy from Northeastern University in the U.S., uh, who believes that we've come to the end of growth, that, in fact, the technological advances that have come about in recent times are completely different from those advances such as railroads, uh, base basic water, uh, the steam engine, that they really enhance production, but Facebook doesn't. And then, as Brendan alluded to, we have the secular stagnationists, if you want to call them that. Did we skip over that? Yeah, who now Larry Summers, the former, uh, former U.S. Treasury Secretary, amongst other things, um, used this phrase a few years ago, and it, it gained a lot of traction. Now, that's a, sl that's a different argument from the growth uh, pessimist, the end of growth argument. Uh, I won't dwell on it much, much more. Who, who's supported by the data? Well, let's, let's start with the U.S., which for pretty much a century has been at the cutting edge of the technological advance in the world. It's been the fastest growing economy, or no, sorry, it's been the richest economy in terms of per capita output. The U.S., apart from a couple of smaller economies, but of all the major economies, it is still a per capita, not talking about distribution, but simply per capita on average, still uh, at the top of the pile. Now, let's have a look at the past six decades of what's happened to per capita growth in the United States. Now, as, as you can see, there, if we were to draw a trend line through here, we see a gradual decline. Okay? This area here in the late 1990s was a period where people thought, okay, maybe the technology picture is kicking in, because it did look as though there was a really good sustained period of strong economic growth in the late 1990s. Uh, that faded, as we can see, from the, from the, over the past decade. And even during the late 1990s, there, a considerable amount of that boost in per capita income average came from one company, Walmart, the use by Walmart, the growth of Walmart and its use of, use of technology. And one could question whether, in an ideal world, one would want uh, a Walmartization of an economy. There are a lot of issues ar around that. Okay, so let's move on, have a look at Europe's last half century. And again, we see not a particularly optimistic picture. Uh, we also see that each, if we look at each of the peak periods uh, of, out of each, each cycle, has been lower each time. So the trend in Europe... Now, that doesn't take, take account of demographics, so it would be slightly flatter, particularly in the early part, if we took, a, took account of demographics. Widen it out, and let's look at the, the G7, the big industrial economies, the, the four big Europeans, Canada, the US, and Japan, 
and compare it with the, the entire world. Now, we know the world has been growing strongly and has actually been accelerating. But look at the difference between global economic growth over the past 30 years and G7, the industrial, big industrial advanced economies. We see a growing divergence. So there, there, there is a problem across the developed world that we're not growing as fast as we used to, and it certainly seems that those who are less optimistic about growth have more of the evidence over the longer term to back them up. It's not to say that the optimists could be proved right. We never know. I was in the forecasting business for a decade. We're not good at forecasting. Okay, since the world changed 2008, profoundly things changed profoundly since 2008, uh, particularly for us in Europe. Before we look at some of the, the bad things that have happened, I think it's always important to focus on strengths. One of the big analytical failings, in my view, whether it's sports analysts or company analysts or economy analysts, is that when somebody is doing well, they focus on strengths and ignore weaknesses. And when somebody is doing badly, they focus on weakness and ignore the strengths. And that can cause a problem in terms of identifying when things change or people can be surprised when an economy starts doing well. So I think it's always important to say, no matter how bad a situation is, look at some of the strengths. And you know, I'll go through these, I won't linger on these, but relative political stability may not last. And I don't take anything for granted. There's very few parts of the world where the rule of law is applied as effectively as it is in Europe. Very high numbers of people in third level education, physical capital, yes, we need more infrastructure spending, certainly, but the quality of infrastructure in, in Europe is very good. One that we definitely don't, don't give ourselves enough credit for, by many measures, European companies are the most globalized in the world. So just one big macro stat that the amount of FDI, foreign direct investment, EU28 companies have together outside the EU28 is bigger considerably bigger than the amount of FDI American companies have outside the US. So other measures as well put, put European companies high up there in terms of how globalized they are. And then we have some highly competitive economies, which is definitely a point I'll come back to. But now, the, the bad stuff. It really has been an unprecedented seven years in terms of economic growth. We haven't had a period like this, I think, in anyone's living memory, um, anyone here at all, uh, certainly back into the first half of the 20th century. The next graphic takes the beginning of 2008 as a starting point and looks at how GDP in Europe, the UK, and the Eurozone, excuse me, the UK and the US has evolved over time. Now, what we can see is the US recovery looks pretty usual. But in fact, that's the slowest recovery of any recovery uh, in recent decades. And the US economy now is about 8% bigger than it was at just before the crisis. We look at the UK. It's recently, over the past 18 months, two years, started to recover more strongly. But it's only just about the same size as it was pre-crisis. And we in the Eurozone have had a very, very weak recovery. Now, there is some sign that the recovery, that there is a recovery starting, but as you can see, the Eurozone economy is still smaller than it was when the crisis hit. Same presentation format. We go back to 2008 and look at the development of the four big economies, France, Germany, Spain, and Italy. Together, those four economies account for 80% of Eurozone output, so the other 15 economies in the Eurozone combined only account for 20%. So when we're talking about the Eurozone, really the big four are, are, account for most of, most of activity. And let's, let's look, and I think one thing may surprise here, but a lot won't. Okay. Now, what we see is the two southern economies, big economies, Spain and Italy, have had very deep recessions, two very deep recessions. Uh, and France and Germany. Now, it may surprise, France is actually much closer to Germany, and the same thing, the same is true for employment. France has actually had very strong employment growth over the past five, uh, seven years, uh, one of the highest, at the higher end of the EU28, and there tends to be a lot of anti-French kind of talk in the Anglophone media in particular, which isn't warranted when you look at them, that they've got their problems, but not, not necessarily warranted. But we see we've got a very big gap between north and south performance. And it's particularly, uh, the Italian situation is particularly worrying because they didn't have a bubble. They've just had protracted long-term slow to, to, to zero growth. Uh, 
Now, this, we, we get closer to the sort of the nub of the matter and why things are as, as uncertain as they are with this. This is the next graphic, shows all 28 EU member states, how they've, evolved, how they've grown since the crisis started or contracted, along with Switzerland, Japan, and the US. Now, I, my apologies for the small size, but to get all those countries in. So as we see in the middle here, the EU euro area is still smaller than it was before the crisis. What I want to draw your attention to is this group of countries right here. We look at Portugal. Now, Portugal had a bailout and has had a considerable contraction and still considerably smaller. But look at the country beside it, Finland. Then Spain, partial bailout, very big property crash. And then we find the Netherlands, then Ireland, and then Denmark. Okay, now that, my point here is that it's not just about north-south. Because we tend to think of the south having more southern countries having got into trouble, and because of the Spain-Italy picture, we sometimes think that it's all a north-south picture. But it's much more complicated than that. And this is where it really gets difficult in terms of growth. There tends to be two broad groups in Europe. Some of them say, we need competitiveness. It's about competitiveness, and those people tend to be anti-stimulus or suspect about using about fiscal and monetary policy to stimulate growth. Well, it's just not, okay? It's simply not all about competitiveness. Why? Finland, the World Economic Forum, by their measure, and it's a pretty good measure, puts Finland as the fourth most competitive economy in the world. Now, of 180 economies, it is highly competitive. It's done a lot of reform, a lot of positive things about the Finns. Yet, they've had one of the biggest contractions in GDP, and they've also had a considerable employment, so output and employment both down. What's another way of measuring competitiveness? The amount you earn from the world relative to the amount you pay out, your balance of payments on current account. Okay, now let's look at the Netherlands. It has a huge surplus, bigger than Germany's. So by that measure, they're doing really well. But again, big output and employment contractions. And finally, Denmark. It's got an even bigger balance of payment surplus, so it's technically more competitive. And again, by any measure of competitiveness, it does very well. But again, a big output and employment contraction. So if it's all about competitiveness, how come these highly competitive countries have done so badly? And it's not just you know, one country like Finland that maybe had the Nokia effect. Uh, it's more complicated than that. Then the second group say, we need stimulus. Let's stimulate our economies, and that will get us out of it. Now, again, it seems very hard to say that, yes, it's just about stimulus. Okay? Japan, massive stimulus. Hasn't seemed to work. UK had a big, particularly monetary stimulus, and as we saw earlier, it was only much later that it began to even get some sort of decent recovery. And Ireland, the two Iberian economies, and the three Baltic economies have all recovered very strongly, particularly the Baltics, that's been going on for a long time, ours for two years or so, and, and the, the Iberian economy more recent. But they've, always, they've almost managed, also managed to recover. So stimulus, it's not just about stimulus either. Okay. So the picture is not as simple or straightforward as either, as, the, as, as either of the two big camps would, would have us believe. But what we all agree with is that we need growth. Okay. We have become addicted to growth. Politically, we've become used to having economic growth, and without it, things start going bad. And we've seen that in, in, in a number of countries, and we've seen uh, a, a change in our politics because of this protracted period of recession. We also need growth because the rate at which debt, public debt is accumulating, uh, technically, theoretically, as Japan shows, it can go a lot further, uh, but there are questions, specific issues about, about Japan's huge debt, uh, and at some point, if you have no growth, your debt dynamics will, will go out of control. And Europe has gone through a very long period of no growth, and it's got a high level of debt. That's just this, for some reason, the debt line, the red line there, the, what, the fast rising one is, is, is debt. Uh, and the blue line is nominal GDP. Uh, and as you can see, debt is rising rapidly 
to the size of uh, annual GDP. So that is a kind of tra trajectory that, even with an activist central bank, is, is not a good picture for Europe. And if growth doesn't materialize, then uh, there, there will be a rupture at some point. OK, so what are the macro levers we have? Well, we've got monetary policy. QE has started. Do we know will QE work? No, we don't. Uh, not, no certainty at all about it, but the argument, one could make the argument, and I do, that the risks, the risks of inaction are greater than the risks of action, and therefore it's fully warranted. But could, 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 could monetary policy go further? So the British use the central bank for a funding for lending mechanism, where they bypass the financial system and try to get money to companies directly. Possibility, certainly. Uh, there has been a, a big problem, and I'll talk about that a little later. Um, and QE for the, uh, QE, what's called QE for the people. Now, big issues about the central bank sending checks to people in the post. Uh, but the, when you go through the argument, it's not as outlandish as it seems. There are big issues politically about it, but it's certainly not as outlandish as it seems. Uh, if you're mired in debt, and you, if you're mired in, 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 in low growth and you need to do something, it's certainly an option that uh, could be, should be left open for the future. And what about fiscal policy? So we have the new Juncker plan. Now, even if that is rolled out, it's, it's very small amounts. Uh, and a lot of it uh, is not really fiscal because it's bringing in private sector money uh, in, in some way. So it's, it's kind of a, 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 an unusual one. So is, is there a case? Um, to my knowledge, nobody else has proposed this. I thought, uh, if, if I can claim originality in anything, and perhaps I can't, and if anybody knows otherwise, please do tell me. But the issuance of short-dated euro bonds, maybe three to five years, which there could be a choice come time to repay where the member states could collectively could repay the, a given portion or they could be rolled over. Many of the fears people have about issuing euro bonds is once you do it, then you, you, you lock, um, you, you, you create a fiscal union automatically. I don't think that's absolutely the case. If there's agreement on who repays the euro bond, there's a collective euro bond issue, uh, and if the group, the countries at the end can agree to roll it over and issue another one, well, then you get into a fiscal union type structure. But that doesn't have to be the case. So if, 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 there was, if a euro bond was issued um, and there wasn't agreement to roll it over, contractually, each group, the, the group of countries standing behind it would then pay their proportion and the whole euro bond would then disappear. So issuing a euro bond is not a one-way street. Um, another uh, issue that's come on the agenda that certainly uh, warrants a lot of thought and, and has a potential to do good things is capital markets union. In some ways in Europe, we've had the worst of capital movements in terms of very destabilizing de capital movements that have helped cause the crisis, while in other ways we haven't had good financial integration. So the banking system, the retail banking system, you often get charged just for using your ATM in another Eurozone country. That kind of retail banking system uh, hasn't come into being. And for businesses, we've still got a big problem with getting capital, getting, getting money to businesses. And the, ultimately, the most, one of the most important functions of, the, of, the, of, of a financial system is to get money from people who have it now but don't need it to people who need it and have a good idea to invest it now. Some issues about over the longer term. If we look at what's happened to credit to companies after each recession over in recent decades, we see a pretty depressing picture. So in the 1970s, credit recovered quickly. In the 1980s, less quickly. Uh, in the 1990s, the different recessions. But in the current recession, uh, credit has actually contracted over that period borrowed from the European Commission a recent report uh, they issued. So how could we improve? What do we, and that's really bad in Europe because our, our, our companies depend so heavily on bank lending. In other countries, it's very different, particularly the US. So in the US, companies, instead of going to the bank for money, they issue their own IOUs. The corporate bond market in the US is much bigger. And this just gives an idea of how different it is. So the U.S., 75% of their borrowing 
comes from the corporate bond market, so they issue bonds directly themselves, and they bypass banks. Eurozone, it's a very small amount. Uh, another issue in terms of European companies accessing money for investment is the stock market. European companies are much less likely to go to the stock market and raise money in the stock market than even some much less developed countries. Now, this is a whole bunch of countries, and the amount of shares outstanding at any given moment in 2012, that happens, relative to GDP. And you'll notice the red countries are non-EU countries, and you'll notice they tend to dominate the upper end. So European companies don't access the stock market or do so much less than many other countries. So you'll see even India there in the middle has a higher level of equity company shares relative to the size of its economy than many European countries which are much more developed. Okay. So an agenda. The Commission puts a lot of focus on securitization. I'm running a little late, so I'm not going to really go into that. It's... I would question whether securitization is the way to go, given how, what a bad history it's had, not just in recent history, but over the longer term. More focus on knocking down those barriers that prevent companies from issuing their own IOUs and bypassing banks, and more work on helping companies to list on the stock market earlier and to do so more easily. And this issue of the ECB, whether or not it could have a more active role. Another big area in the sort of micro area is services. The market for services now has come to dominate all developed economies. And let's just look at services as a percentage of GDP across a, a group of countries. And we see that the trend is universally upwards. So services come to dominate as economies become more advanced. Services come to dominate. And that is universal. I don't know of a country, any country where that, is not, that trend is not the case. So in, in, in advanced companies, between a third and three quarters of output is accounted for by services. What about jobs? There's a lot of talk these days about jobs being disappearing because of technology. Um, certainly, I don't think there's strong evidence for that because the number of people employed mostly across the world continues to rise. But what we also see is that it is the case in manufacturing and agriculture. We look at a 10-year period up to the crisis here, and we see in Europe, we see that all employment growth in the, advanced, the 15 most developed EU countries, the long-term members, all employment growth came from the services sector. So it's a bigger chunk of output. It's accounting for all net employment growth. And, oh, that came more quickly. Uh, and in terms of services ex exports, there hasn't been as much growth as one might expect. Now, there's an element to that that exporting services in many cases is very difficult because inherently, if you know, the classic case is a haircut, you can't give somebody a haircut in another country that you consume, you provide and consume a service. In some cases, uh, you have to be uh, in the same place. That said, one of the things that's striking about uh, this graphic is that Europe's services outside of Europe, the growth in services, and growth within the EU has been pretty similar. In fact, it's been stronger outside the EU. Now, what does that say about the single market? We're supposed to have a single market in Europe, yet our services exports are growing more quickly outside the EU than among ourselves. One reason, huge amount of services are excluded from the services directive, and again, this is an issue the Commission is pushing as a way of unleashing growth, although there are plenty of questions, not least political questions, uh, around that. So, is there any certainty about any of those things? No, we could become more competitive, and it may not unleash growth. We could introduce big stimulus, and it could act as a sugar rush. Could get the economy going for six months, a year, and then peter out, and we're back where we started, but with more debt and a central bank with a bigger balance sheet. We don't know. But what we do know is that without growth, we are certainly coming, going into more difficult times politically and financially in terms of the, the, the coming closer to, to a, a, a default. And we certainly know from recent years how big a shock that can be for the system. Therefore, what should we do? Well, perhaps a grand bargain. Perhaps do everything. 
you keep both sides of the political spectrum happy, and because we don't know what creates growth, what guarantee, that anything is guaranteed to create, create growth, if you use a scattergun approach and try everything, hopefully something will work. Thank you.